This class is part of the basics series for the dementia caregiver class in Wake Forest, North Carolina. And the topic that we're talking about today is uh, coping skills. It's sort of part two of the coping skills. And uh, we're focusing on building resilience techniques. Resilience is something that's very important for you to think about as a caregiver, because caregivers who are able to become more resilient are much more likely to have an easier experience in the caregiver journey and also to at the end of it to be healthier and stronger and much more balanced. So let's dig into some things that you might not have thought of uh, that would fall into this category. Uh, today we're going to touch on several things that can help you in building your resilience as a dementia caregiver. According to counselors, our self-talk is one of the most powerful influences on how we behave. The way we talk to ourselves is important. We tend to believe what we tell ourselves more than what others tell us. So let's think about what are you telling yourself? What are you saying to yourself day in and day out? What do you hear in your own mind? What's going on? Are you saying stuff like, I just can't do this? Oh, will this never end? I've just lost them. This is terrible. This, this, just, this is just the most awful thing that could ever have happened. Are you saying those kinds of things? I want you to think about if you are, what that is doing to you actually physically in your body on a chemical level, on a cellular level, is it helping you? And so I want you to reframe this and I want you to think about approaching what you tell yourself, your self-talk in a different way. And so the things that we tend to repeat and repeat kind of have a, a name, they're called mantras. And they're the things that tend to express a basic belief. And it, it indicates a guide for our behavior. And so uh, just several years ago, uh, I'm part of a moderator for an online support group for uh, spouses, dementia caregivers, and it's called LBD Caring Spouses. And the moderators asked uh, the people who were the members to please give us, what are your mantras? What are the things you're saying to yourself? And uh, so I'm gonna pull from some of those that came from the group and see if I can get you to rethink how you're speaking to yourself. Nobody may hear it. It may just all be quiet, silent in your own mind, but it's very, very powerful. So how can we use that? We all do it. How can we use that as a technique to build resilience, to help us, to move us into a, a, a framework, into a way of thinking that's going to make this easier than it might otherwise be? So let's talk about a few of those. My, uh, those of you who've uh, heard anything that I've spoken have probably heard me uh, already say that my uh, go-to mantra is choose the lesser stressor. And uh, choose the lesser stressor is basically just saying, uh, I've got maybe two choices or three choices. I'm gonna choose the one that is going to create less stress for me or less stress for my loved one. And so it may wrap itself around special events like Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter or a, a family gathering. Um, and think about how you used to do that and think, hmm, that's pretty stressful how I used to do that when I add on my caregiving routine and all the responsibilities there. So I'm gonna do it differently. I'm gonna let, I'll provide the place, everybody come here so we can all be together and my loved one can be a part of it because they may not be able to travel anymore but I'm gonna let other people do everything else. Bring the food, bring the entertainment. You guys work that out and think about that and I'll just provide the place. That's choosing the lesser stressor. Uh, reducing the number of doctors in your story is gonna give you less stress and if you can possibly do that. I was able to put John's doctor uh, number at two, a primary care physician and uh, his neurologist. 
and that simplified things. I noticed that when he went into hospice care and we were adding another new physician who didn't have any history at that point, uh, it became a little bit more complicated. And so uh, trying to reduce that number if you can uh, and saying no to things that complicate, complicate your schedule uh, and add to your stress load, that is choosing the lesser stressor. You can do those things later. Uh, you can come back to those later. But for right now, choose the lesser stressor and do less versus more or what was usual for you before this thing started out. Uh, another uh, mantra that you might think of uh, is look for the treasures in the darkness. This is a dark journey. Um, I, I titled my book Treasures in the Darkness because that was what I experienced. Another way of saying this mantra might be find the joy in each day. Uh, it's, this is a strategic, proactive seeking of positive impacts. You're looking for the good stuff. You're not denying the reality of what's going on, but you're making purposeful choices to see beyond the obvious. You're gonna just, just try to hang in there and look for the, for the joy. And when you find the joy, magnify the joy if you can. Try to make it last a little longer. Embrace it. Live in it. And that will make your journey better. It'll make it easier. Uh, I use the mantra, outsmart Louie. I uh, saw uh, Louie. I gave uh, John's disease a nickname. I personified it, which is one of the things I recommend. Um, and I separated Louis' antics from John's personhood. And I simply tried to figure out, I tried to get ahead of it. I tried to learn as much about the disease as I possibly could, and then stay ahead of it and prepare for likely impacts that could happen before they occurred. And so I would outsmart Dewey, little practical uh, Louis. I would outsmart him by doing little practical things like uh, getting in a shower chair way before I knew I'd need it, getting in the depends and, and slipping a couple of them into the underwear drawer, into John's underwear drawer years before we needed it because I knew it was going to come up at some point. It was likely to come up. So when I wasn't stressed about buying it, I just picked it up when I was at Walmart one day and then put it in his drawer. And it was there. And when it was needed the first time, I didn't go through the stress of having to go to the store and buy it. And that's another choose a lesser stressor, but it's outsmarting Louie as well. You're getting ahead of him. Uh, and it's learning how to manage the behavioral stuff. That's another example where you're just not letting it get to you when they do things that they do. Um, that just are coming as a part of the disease. And it's not something they would be doing on this day if they didn't have that disease. Learning how to get around that and outsmarting Louie, which we've had some lessons about and will continue to do so in this class. Drop the rope, don't take the bait. And my favorite version of this is don't feed the monster. This is very specific to behavioral issues. Just don't get caught up in the argument. When they toss the rope out and yank on the rope to try to bring you in, accusing you of something you didn't do, you drop the rope. Nope, not gonna go there. Not gonna feed the monster. Not gonna take that bait. You might even apologize when you've done nothing wrong. No one can argue by themselves. So if you don't take the bait, if you don't feed the monster, and then you just get out of the room as soon as possible, what are they gonna do? They can't argue by themselves. So walk away if you can with a pleasant excuse to get something that you forgot. Take some deep breaths in a different location and then come back into the story with a big smile on your face as if nothing happened. That's a version of outsmarting Louie and also not feeding the monster. Another mantra that you may want to use is saying to yourself, instead of, I just can't do this, say to yourself, flip that and say to yourself, this is doable. This moment is doable. I can do and manage what's right in front of me.
very important mantra. This is doable. And that's staying, if you stay in the moment and don't get caught up in it, focus on how can I manage this? How can I do this? This is doable. Another important mantra for medicines is one change at a time. And then a second one is start low and go slow. Start low, go slow, and make only one change at a time. That means start at the lowest possible dose for a dementia patient who's got an impaired brain and a brain that is damaged and is degener degenerating. And so you've got to start and be very careful what powerful chemical you put there. So start at a low dose and then slowly titrate up, or if you're getting off of it, titrate down. And don't do more than one thing with the medicine at a time. Stay calm, another mantra, stay calm and avoid the ER. Stay out of the emergency room. If you have a dementia patient, there's a 75% chance they're gonna come out worse than they went in. So try to avoid it. And that's because there's so many people, medical people there who do not know how to manage Lewy body dementia. And they focus on only dealing with the one particular symptom that person comes in with. And so they can, they can mess up the medicines. They can give a, a very dangerous medicine um, and create a lot of chaos in the name of trying to do something good. So try to stay calm and avoid the ER. The example I like to give for that is when John uh, fell one time and ripped his ear, actually tore about a half an inch uh, of the cartilage on his ear. There was a little bit of, a tiny bit of blood um, and because he hit the side of the buffet when he came down the handle on the buffet. Uh, there were a couple of uh, folks visiting us at that time and they said, oh, you need to take him to the ER. Well, we were well into the journey by then. And I knew that the ER was what I called one of the most dangerous places on earth for John, because a lot of bad stuff could happen there. And so I thought, hmm, let me look at this. So I took the time, instead of rushing off the ER, I stayed calm. I took the time to really look at his injury, to ask him if he had hit his head otherwise, you know, covering the bases. And then when I realized that it was really a tear to his ear, I called a pharmacist because it happened on a Saturday. I had to call the Walmart pharmacist, not our regular one. Um, and uh, I asked if there's been a tear to the, to the cartilage, uh, do, are there some things that I can come over there and get? What do you recommend that I use to clean the wound and kind of put it back together until we can get to the doctor's office on Monday? The pharmacist told me there were three things. And uh, I, the people who were there, I asked if they would stay with John, please. I ran over to Walmart, got the three things with the help of the pharmacist, came back, cleaned him up, patched him up. And on Monday morning, we went in to see the primary care doctor. And she said, Pat, you did exactly the right thing. This was not, this did not need to go to the ER. So the folks who were there who didn't really have that in-depth experience with John, uh, just went the automatic way, Let's, you should take him to the ER. So remember, as one of your mantras, avoid that ER if you can, stay calm, try to figure out another way to manage the situation if you possibly can. And speaking of medical professionals, another mantra is pick your battles. When you are dealing with, especially if your loved one is in a facility, um, be very careful that you're not the person who's constantly creating um, issues. Um, you're labeled as a troublemaker. Pick your battles carefully, do your homework and prepare. You also need to use this mantra, pick your battles with family issues. Um, and you have to decide when are we gonna let go? When are we gonna persevere? And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Another mantra is stay in the moment. Stay in the moment, one day at a time, one hour at a time, sometimes one minute at a time. Staying in the moment, practicing what's called mindfulness is hugely, hugely important for building resiliency because you don't drain your energy thinking about what's in the past or what might happen in the future. You're staying where you really can have an impact. So I hope you will embrace stay in the moment and take one day at a time. 
Last of all, I hope you will tell yourself, I'm doing the best that I can. And he, my loved one or she, is doing the best they can. This is tough stuff. So be gentle with yourself. Be kind with yourself. I'm doing the best that I can. He's doing the best that he can. Those are good things to keep repeating. And remember what I said at the beginning. I said that counselors have learned to tell us who need this counsel that what we say to ourselves is much more powerful than we realize and we tend to believe it. So if you're telling yourselves these things that I just listed for you, it's going to become a part, a practice, a part of who you are as a caregiver, a part of how you frame this season of your life, a part of how the story is going to unfold. So I hope you can embrace that to build resiliency and better coping skills for yourself. Now I wanna talk about another way to do it that's, that's different. And that is the issue of forgiveness. Now a diagnosis of dementia doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in the context of normal life experience. And that means that the diagnosis occurs. When it occurs, there's already a history that includes some hurtful experiences. We all have them. Most of us have close family and friend relationships that include some pain. This is the reason why I wrote the longest chapter in my book, Treasures in the Darkness. And that chapter was entitled Family Issues and Support. By the time I wrote that book, I had learned about many examples of stress and pain that caregivers experienced while they grappled with the emotional history of close relationships alongside the difficulties of disease management required by dementia. In addition to that, what do you as a caregiver do when there's also hurt and pain with the relationship you have with your loved one who just received the diagnosis or maybe received it several years ago? The simplest way to handle this struggle is forgiveness. Forgiveness is a key first step to healthy caregiving. It will build resilience in you. It's important to note that there's an enormous difference between simple and easy. Sometimes forgiveness can happen quickly, <clears throat> but often it's a lengthy and layered process. I found that counseling helped both my husband and me with that process. Lewy body dementia forced us to get busy with relationship repair in its early stages. And we were assisted with identifying and clarifying issues that needed to be addressed and learning to navigate with more wisdom because of our counselor. And this strengthened us in our journey. Now, the counseling process provided easy access to an independent problem solver who helped me work through other relationship issues with wisdom during John's illness and afterwards in the grieving process. His help made caregiving easier in hundreds of practical ways. The most important of those was keeping my own balance while navigating for both John and me throughout the journey. It's so easy to get off balance while on such a long haul. Our son referred to it as a long slog. This is an apt description. Past hurts and current disappointments can quickly take over in your thoughts, draining you of much needed energy for the daily demands of caregiving. Forgiveness needs to be for both past issues and for current things that happen. Once there's a healthy release of the past hurts, the current ones often can be managed more easily. 
This is especially true if you have wise counsel available to give you perspective in the midst of them. Forgiveness liberates the person who forgives. The release of anger, resentment, and judgment of another person actually frees the person who's carrying those feelings around inside. It takes a lot of energy to carry those heavy emotions with you all the time. Letting them go is like dropping a bag of rocks or allowing a heavy chain to slide off your shoulders. That energy is now available to you for better choices. And with dementia caregiving, you need all the energy you can muster. Forgiveness of the person with dementia is also crucial. How are you going to manage all the demands of caring for such a complex disease if you're still carrying that bag of rocks or that heavy chain called unforgiveness with you every day? You aren't. It's too much to carry. How do I do that, you may say? The feelings are intense and the history's long. You say, I forgive John. Say the name of the person who wronged you. As the Papa character in the movie The Shack said, quote, you may have to say it a thousand times before you feel any different, but keep saying it. If you cannot forgive them yourself, then ask God to give you his forgiveness for that person. One thing I learned in counseling was the power of the spoken word. The spoken word has great power to harm and to heal. After you've made the decision to forgive and while you continue to repeat it for as long as it takes, then you have another choice to make. Do I persevere in this relationship during the dementia journey or do I let it go? during the journey. I decided to persevere with those who were trying to work with John and me, even though their words and actions were sometimes painful and frustrating to me. It was worth it to me to deal with that when I knew they wanted to do the right thing and they kept trying to do that. Growth happened within them and within me in those relationships. Today, those relationships are stronger and better because of the struggle. I'm glad that I didn't throw up my hands and just give up. Now, I decided to let go of a relationship with a close family member during my caregiver journey. That person did not stay engaged with us, but faded away and disappeared when that support was most needed by me. It was terribly painful. I finally had to decide to let that relationship go because she was not willing to work with me at all. The pain from it was too draining to my emotional energy. Our counselor helped me to deal with this process. And by the way, now we are very, very close. John passed away in 2015. And I was able to then have the energy and the time to reach out again. And even that relationship is now better. But I sure had to let it go during the journey. Now, there's a poem by an unknown author, which I included in full in my book. But today I want to share some some lines from it. It defines the healthy perspective of letting go for the right reasons at a time such as this. Here's a quote. To let go does not mean to stop caring. It means I can't do it for someone else. To let go is not to cut myself off. 
It's the realization that I cannot control another. To let go is to admit powerlessness, which means the outcome is not in my hands. To let go is not to try to change or blame another. It's to make the most of myself. Now, the dual decisions to forgive and to either persevere or let go of a relationship during the caregiver journey are important steps to take. The power of forgiveness is of great value and should not be neglected or avoided. The gift of forgiveness is freedom and peace. You are no longer in the grip of anger, resentment, and even bitterness. You're free to move forward and do what you were meant to do with your life. So here's a little assignment I'd like to give you. Ask yourself, who do I need to forgive? And then ask God to give you his forgiveness of that person if you cannot forgive him or her yourself. Then reflect on whether to let them go or to persevere with that person while you're on the caregiver journey. Okay, now we're going to move into another series of kind of techniques or something I want you to think about that will build resilience for you that you may not have thought about. This one is backed up with a lot of research data. Um, it's as a very important element of resilience building. And uh, so let's, let's talk for a minute about the power of thankfulness. Now, I am a Jesus follower. And a book that has helped me through my Louis Body Dementia caregiver journey and beyond is Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. It's set up in daily readings format. And so it's, it's very easy for a stress giver to, uh, a stress caregiver to pick it up and read little bites at a time. Sarah Young's bites can often provide powerful nutrition for the soul and the heart at key times. Certainly did for me. In the November section of her book, she focuses on thankfulness as a theme. I had been reading it along with my morning coffee and I'm gonna remember now with you what she said that played out in my Louis Body Dementia journey with John. Young says that thankfulness is not some magic formula, but that there is an element of mystery in the transaction between God and us when we choose to be thankful. And here's how she explains it in a slightly paraphrased form of her November 24th reading. She says, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, you give God thanks regardless of your feelings and God gives you joy regardless of your circumstances. This is a spiritual act of obedience, at times blind obedience. To people who do not know God intimately, it can seem irrational and even impossible to thank God for heart-rending hardships. Nonetheless, those who obey God in this way are invariably blessed, even though the difficulties remain. Thankfulness opens your heart to God's presence and your mind to God's thoughts. You may still be in the same place with the same set of circumstances, but it is as if a light has been switched on, enabling you to see from God's perspective. It is this light of my presence that removes the sting from adversity, end of quote. 
Caregivers, I found this to be true. I can't explain it, but I know it happened as I cared for John day in and day out for years. Not that I was always consistent with this discipline. The daily grind of caring for a Lewy body dementia patient is hard and even grueling at times. But when I did practice thankfulness, it looked something like this. John and I would sit on the screen porch and take in the pastoral view as we ate lunch. I might comment about how beautiful the bird song sounded and how lovely the leaves of the trees looked as they swayed in a gentle breeze. Aren't we blessed to have this place to enjoy together, John? We don't even need to travel to have a pretty vacation view. I would say this to him and he would agree. Another time I would walk through the house look around me and thank God for a pleasant and safe place to live while we were going through this hard time in our lives. Many times when John and I would come home from the grocery store, we'd comment about how nice it was to have the pretty ramp entryway to our house that I had built very early in the story. It made it easy for us to bring in our groceries. Hundreds of times, I thanked God for allowing my sweet mama to still be with us and to share her unconditional love and support often on the telephone day in and day out. Sarah Young was right. When I thought or said those things, there was a change and those things might be different for you, but we all have those things to be thankful for. So what was the change? There was a peace and a quiet joy. They were there and they tended to linger. It was almost like a protective covering that sealed out some of the pain. My energy was increased rather than drained. My focus changed to positive ways to make a difference in our lives rather than dwelling on losses that I could not retrieve. It was not denial of circumstance. It was an enhancement of circumstance. Now caregivers, these kinds of things, the things you say to yourself, the practice of forgiveness, even though it can be hard and may feel impossible, the practice of thankfulness, this reframing of the way you approach your whole life in this season of your life can build powerful resilience in you. It can make a huge difference in your health, in your sense of well being, in your energy, in your attitude. And in the final outcome of how this whole story goes and what condition you're in at the end of it. So I hope you'll embrace some of these. And I know that they may not be the typical things that you might be have expected to hear in a coping skills class, but I think they're foundational. I think they're fundamental. And I know for certain that in my life, in my caregiver journey, they made a massive, massive difference. So I hope they'll do that for you. Even if just a little bit, if you pick and choose the things that can apply to your situation, I hope you'll do that. You deserve to have a gentle journey because what you're doing is important. What you're doing is vital and what you're doing is heroic and good. You're doing God's work on earth every single day that you take care of your loved one. Thank you for doing that. And I hope you have a better day today.